grace and peace to you from our God, the loving Father, life-giving Father, Creator, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may have guessed by now that the overwhelming message and the miracle of Pentecost is probably communication. Communication so that all the people can hear the good news of God, so that on that day, some 2,000 years ago, the day of Pentecost, the, the Galileans were heard to speak in various tongues. You've heard them mentioned in the reading of the Gospel. The Vedes, people from Mesopotamia, immigrants from Rome, Jews, Israelites, just to name a few. But this is Pentecost Sunday. And several years ago, we got up very early to get to the airport. I lived some 60 miles from O'Hare, out in Illinois. And I joined up with 12 other people from the facility. Six of these 12 would get on another plane and fly from Chicago to Atlanta. And out of Atlanta, they would take a flight over to Paris. Those with me, we would fly directly to Paris. People from the West Coast would fly in to Boston, and from Boston to Paris. Because the chairman did not want the whole crew, the whole leadership team, on the same flight. He wanted us on different flights, just in case. Now this didn't make us feel very good, but just in case, he wanted us to be on different flights. And so we arrived in Paris and got on a small regional plane and went some 150 to 200 miles south to the border of, of France and Spain. Now the whole intent of our going and people coming from some 20 different countries to join into this gathering was to create a new company. All of the paperwork had been done. The monies had changed hands. All that was left was for us to implement the plan. <laughs> According to my packet, we would be with 150 people. This would be for the formation of a new company. And we had worked on our parts of it for about three months. We were to be wholly owned by a larger company of some 70,000 people. At this gathering, the leadership of the new company would hear the goals, would hear the new vision statements, and would get the marching orders. And in addition, we would be able to communicate with people that we had never seen before in our lives. And we would be doing things, and we would know who would be stationed where. The difficulty was, with people from different countries, all of us could not understand each other. We could understand the chairman because he spoke five different languages. Thank God the official language of the new company would be English. For I had had two years of, of uh, German in undergraduate school. But I didn't do that well and I didn't take the course that serious. And I had to remark to people, if I had known that I would be leading a German laboratory, I would have done better in the class, but that was history. As I said, they wanted us to know something about each other, our cultures, language, and the barriers that we would like, that we would face. Today, as you know, is the day of Pentecost, the birthday of the church, the beginning of the Jesus movement that was launched into the world. That was a day when the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that rested upon Jesus at his baptism, came down to rest on the followers. As a movement, just over 2,000 years ago, God's kingdom had come. God's kingdom had come on earth as it was in heaven. question for us this morning is, how do we speak? What language do we use? 
how do we talk to each other? How do we speak to the world? Perhaps, again, we should go and think on the day of Pentecost as a day of lessons to teach us, following God's example, how to speak. As such, it starts the reign of God on earth. On this day, the goodness of God, God's justice, God's mercy, and God's abounding love for all people was announced. God gave agency to the church and to his leaders. Each person, as you've heard, heard the message in their own language, and it was understood in the context of their language. Again, how do we speak? How do we communicate with each other? We have to acknowledge that the church's mission is empowered with gifts of participation, the intimate indwelling. We understand from John that peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And we confess that Christ calls us to reconciliation, to wholeness. We become deeply aware that some people don't understand this. We are also are aware, as it is our mission statement, that some people have sometimes been excluded from the church. Some people have been hurt by the church. So how do we reconcile that with the mission of the church? I have three sons and one daughter. All of them were trained in science, except the daughter. But she confesses while she didn't major in science, she did marry an engineer. So they qualified her to be a scientist of some type. But they were very, very critical of the church. Each one of them were baptized in the church. Each one of them were confirmed. Each one of them, except for once, stopped going to church because they were very critical of what was going on in the church. We had to remind them that those fine little colleges that they attended out east were formed and started by the Congregational Church. We had to remind them that that grade school that they attended was a Catholic grade school. We had to remind them that they got their degrees, at least two of them, from a Congregational University out east. And so the church, perhaps, with all of its faults, with all the other things that it's done, could not have been really that bad because if the church were really that bad, many of us, including them, would probably be bad as well. So we see throughout the history of the church that there has been a combination of partnerships, a combination of other things. But among the most important things that has happened, the church has maintained hope for us as God's people. Despite everything that is going on, all of the injustices, all of the wrongdoings, the church still provides hope for that. So we imagine that everything that goes on is the source of the reign of God on earth. You've heard of singing and praying, and we often try to sing and pray things into existence. From the musical Leaders and Robins, we hear the song about dreams. Very popular song. I dream of dreams and time goes by. I dream that God will be forgiven. But the tigers come at night with their voices as soft as thunder. As they tear the hope apart and they turn your dreams to shame. Life is difficult, but the church God's church on earth has provided for us that hope through our faith. Dreams often get turned to shame, and the cost of these dreams is life itself. This is a season of hope, of peace, a renewal. This is marked by a continuous, in fact, war in Ukraine. It is marked by the fact that over a million people have died of COVID-19 disease. It is marked 
by the fact that senseless mass shooting of babies, for example, in Texas, of old black people in Buffalo, New York, of young teenagers killing each other, of two doctors in Tulsa, Oklahoma, of seven career women right here in Metro Atlanta. In spite of this, God's kingdom is on earth. Can there be justice? Can there be love when babies are gunned down in their classrooms? Can there be justice when people ride around and shoot each other on the streets? Can there be justice? Can there be love in road rage on the interstate highways? We know that the pandemic was caused by a virus. And as, a, as an aside, a virus is not a living entity. It is a combination, an ordered combination, of DNA, maybe RNA, of a protein or two, and lipids, all folded nicely into a package. But it's not living. But it causes pandemic. Because when it interacts in a human system, comes in contact with cells in the human body, then it is suddenly activated and it starts reproducing itself. It then becomes alive, and pretty soon, if not checked, it will take over the entire system and kill the host. <clears throat> but that is one kind of pandemic. That is a biological pandemic. The kind of pandemic that we're living through right now is one of spiritual concerns. The spiritual concern of this other pandemic, social pandemic, I'll name it, is characterized by self-centeredness. The feeling among many people that what I think and what I feel is the truth. The feeling that because I think it and because I feel it, it must be true and that is what we do. It is a feeling that I will not take direction from anybody. It's a feeling that I don't like to be told what to do. And so, in the million or so people who died of, um, of COVID-19 disease. It is estimated now that 450 of them did not need to die if they had followed certain basic principles. And so we see in the history of mankind, all throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we see people defying directions as given, even the directions as given by God. And thus, we suffer the consequences. We see in this new pandemic people who are doing and saying the unthinkable. In fact, the unthinkable has become thinkable. We see great pain and suffering and death. We see this on social media. We see this in our communications. We see it certainly on TV. We saw it, for example, even during the awarding of the, uh, the uh, Academy Awards, where two friends, one slapped the other publicly. What is the example that young people get from that? What is the example that young people see with our politicians at this time? So we see that the second pandemic, the spiritual pandemic, is caused probably by a lack of leadership, a lack of good leadership, a lack of role models. It can be said that I am unhappy, and because I am unhappy, I'll take my feelings out on you. Perhaps I'll take an AK-15 and go and shoot up people. We have been on this pandemic, and we've seen this for a long time. The pandemic has caused isolation, it is true. But during this pandemic, we have been locked in. We have accumulated greed, hurt, disappointment, fear, and we have hungered for power, and that has had an effect on all of us. Not just the people on the street, but also people of goodwill, human decency, all races, all stripes, and all religions, practically everybody has been affected. But Jesus taught that love can make a way out of no way, and if you dare follow God's way of love, you will find his way of life, and his final way is not injurious for people. 
But there's a word of caution. And that word of caution is found in the book of James. And remember his words. His words that faith or prayer without works is dead. Pray as you must, but you must also get off your knees and do something. Remember the words of the psalmist when he said, it is he that has made us, not we ourselves. We remember the words of Jesus when he asked us to care for our neighbors. So this morning, we invite you to speak in tongues, to speak the love language of God, to follow the way of Jesus, and to be careful in how we speak. It is not just enough to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, to set prisoners free, but we also need to speak to each other in a loving kind of way, to speak God's language and that language is a language of love. And so we ask, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, let it be so. Amen.